So you got to you, you got to sell you got to separate. Um, when do you have the right to resist the government, and when is it wise to? And if three guys approach you in the street with AK-47s and ask you for a thousand dollars from an ATM, you may well do it because you don't want to die, right? And you'd rather be separated from a thousand dollars than your life. And likewise, the federal government, which I think at the moment their taxation is tyrannically, um, basically polite theft. But many of us will pay our taxes because it, that's better than going to jail, right? And so it's it's just one of those situations. And so likewise, if if you were stopped by the police. At a, at a traffic stop, maybe, and a police officer was being a bit rough with your daughter or your wife, right? At that point, you have the right to resist him. But if you do that, you're probably going to get shot. And so um, you're, in that, you're in a very fine line. When do you have a right to resist the government and when are you wise to? And... Um, it takes special care and prudence. I don't, I don't think I've got a one size fit fits all um, um, response, but um, thankfully I've never been put in a situation that I have to um, make a choice. That, thus far, at least, anyway, in America. Mm. There's some things that would be easy if you were told by civil government you cannot preach the gospel. You would, that wouldn't be a negotiable. Of course, so you can't. You know. I would not stop preaching the gospel. The early the apostles said, "Look, we're not going to stop. Whatever, no matter what you say. So you can put us in jail, you can beat us and kill us, do whatever you want to, but we're not going to stop doing what Christ commands us to do." Some of these other things were. Not at the same level, but something like that you would draw a line on clearly. Oh, thank you. My brain is tired. So, yes, I was thinking of gray areas, but you, no one can give you the right to sin or break one of God's commandments. And so if they, for, if they forbid me to obey God, obviously you obey God and politely refuse the civil magistrate. Very good. Our next question is, what will be the indicators in society that an organized Persecution of Christians is um, That's a good question. I think it'll be like the um, boiling of the frog. They'll slowly turn up the water, and uh, it'll, it'll happen. Salami tactics. I don't, don't think we'll push us too hard at once. We'll just gradually turn up the pressure, and it'll sift the church. And, um, but I'm, you know, I don't think we're too far away from that. One of the priests in Savannah said, I will die in my grave. My, my successor will die in prison and his successor will die in the gibbet. And that, that's maybe a bit extreme, but I, I, it's not too far away, I think, before we'll see Christians being put in jail. Like that lady in, in England who was arrested for praying quietly outside a outside the abortion, clinic. abortion clinic it's just i mean i it, i it still pinch myself to think of of that happening back in the homeland it's just bizarre there'll, there'll be some other things before that i think which are economic in nature i think there'll be efforts legislatively to remove our tax exempt status and things of that nature uh, that will restrict us in some ways or or Restrict us economically before we actually. Yes, yeah, right, yes. Mm. Very bad, but that's, I think you're right about that. I also think that there is some sense in which I don't think you can you can pick a number of things that will happen before persecution comes, because I think in some sense we see so much change even within a generation, as we've experienced maybe recently. Even uh, you see uh, during. Uh, during the, the COVID pandemic, how pressure on the church was ratcheted up very, very, and so I don't, I don't know if you always get the luxury of, oh well, look, it's coming now, so let's get ready. Like I think sometimes it's just because of the nature of the hatred of God in the world, in the natural man, he will tolerate the church for a season, but he will also turn on the church uh, in a moment. I think you're more apt to see it in urban areas. 
then you're going to see it in rural areas. People are more dependent on government in urban areas. They're more willing to accept what government does. There's more of a mood of resistance, I think, in rural areas. It may not be monolithic across the board. It may be in different places. It's already that way in some ways. Okay, very good. Uh, the second one is given Second Corinthians four verse four, John chapter fourteen verse thirty. Doesn't Satan rule first before Christ comes again? It's limited power. Is that for me? So I think, so I, I think um, Christ rules the earth. Um, Christ, the devil is bound now, I believe, and Christ is exalted far above rule, every rule and authority and power and dominion. Paul says, and God has put all things in subjection under Christ's feet now, and has given him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all, and yet. Just like with uh, Iraq after America invaded and kind of dethroned uh, Saddam Hussein, and America then became functionally in charge of Iraq, there was a spiritual, there was a physical insurgency against American forces, and things got worse before they got better. But I think the devil has been dethroned; he's been he's been he's been bound, and yet in the lives of unbelievers. Part of the judgment of God against the unbelieving world when Adam and Eve listened to the devil. Uh, rather than the voice of God, part of the judgment for that essentially was God saying, okay, if you want the devil to be your, your Lord and Master or have at it. And so for um, thousands of years, the devil became functionally the, the, the thrall-keeping tyrant over the Gentile worlds. And while his back has been broken, there's still echoes of his rule in the lives of those who refuse to believe in Jesus. And they, and they are his willing, is it a fellow Duloy Calvin says, his, his willing slaves. And they can't obey Christ because they won't obey Christ, and because they won't, they can't. Yeah, I also think uh, the book of Job tells you that even when it seems like the devil is exercising dominion, he's actually seeking permission before he can do anything. And so we, don't, we, do, not, we do not need to fear the devil. Uh, as one who rules with uh, an, an, an autonomous power, who's bound, like, like Neil was saying, he's bound by God, and, and anything that God allows him to do, the devil has permission in God's overall plan. So. He's also finite. The, the Puritans used to say he's God or devil. Man, yes, yeah, great. What, yeah. That's God's devil. That's great. And yeah, this last one related to civil management kind of related to like the question before last. Given the current state of the church in the West, what changes do you expect to see in the church if when the state and society begin an organized persecution of Christians? I think we'll see, I think it'll force people to reveal their true colors. Um, so I think it'll be a sifting time when we will see uh, the wolves in sheep's clothing uh, depart from the church. And the church may shrink, but the true church will stand up. I think all the light shows and the smoke machines will be gone. <laughs> yeah, you'll need theology. It's amazing, you know, the book of Hebrews, uh, I've often thought about it. In Hebrews 12, he says, You have not yet restricted, resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. That's pretty ominous. You have not yet. And this is, these are Jews who'd been basically disenfranchised, kicked out of their houses, lost, been struck, been cut off from, the, from their parents' inheritance. They were no longer wel welcome at the feasts and were essentially um, exiled from their communities. And God's response is to give them one of the deepest and most theologically searching books in the New Testament, that you need theological fortitude to endure um, bloodshed for your faith. You know, I don't think you're going to want to risk your life just to be entertained. Exactly. Okay, well, those are all the, the questions related to the school of magic. All the things to think about. Okay. Uh, the next section is um, <laughs> one of family things. This is as a of tips for keeping a spirit of joy and peace in your home when you feel like all you do is discipline children day in and day out and disobedience. <laughs> I'm sure that's both. 
that come from your wife? I, I, I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how do you maintain? Well, well, I think uh, part of it is, of course, because you, you parent from your knees, so you're in prayer. And so your motivation for what you're doing comes from prayer in terms of um, you're asking for endurance, you're asking for wisdom to discern, you're asking for strength to address what is most pressing and grace to be patient in, in the raising up of your children. So you have lots of things like that. And I think one of those things is joy that you're praying for. You're praying that, uh, so Psalm 127, children are a blessing from God. You have to believe that. And so, uh, so you're praying uh, that you would see that clearly. And then I also, uh, I also think that, practically speaking, when you, you see a lack of joy expressed in your home, you address it, whether it be in your own heart or in the conversations between siblings or even in your own discussion with your wife. Uh, my dad used to call, used to ask if he and mom had had an argument. He said, no, we've had a time of intense fellowship. So if you've had times of intense fellowship, uh, you want to make sure that, that that's corrected as well in your own marriage, in your own life. And, but I think that that comes from your knees. That, that the, the Lord gives you through his spirit joy. It's one of the gifts of the, the teaching spirit. And so I think a lot of that is in prayer. But then what you see expressed in your family, you address it, uh, making sure that you're leading your family. Jack Miller used to always ask people, um, where is your joy, right? And Jack Miller gets, he's kind of the modern day father of sonship and the sonship movement went, to, his disciples took it in very bad directions, but as best I can ascertain, Jack Miller was a good man and a godly <coughs> man and he feared the Lord greatly. But that question, where is your joy, is a very diagnostic question. And if your joy is gone, it's always a bad sign. It, you, your, your soul's not well connected to Christ. And if we can't, if we can't be joyful parents in the home, it would almost be better that we were not Christians at all, because a joyless Christian is a contradiction in terms. And children are always attracted to joy. When I see, um, when I see families that do well spiritually and the children are vibrant and healthy, one of the signs, um, apart from life in their eyes, is that, that generally the, the, their parents manage by the grace of God and the Holy Spirit to maintain a joyful spirit in the house. And, and children are attracted to joy. However, there are seasons of great trial and difficulty in your homes, and you have to persevere through, the, <clears throat> through those times of difficulty, even when you may be struggling. And I would assume that that was a, a, a inquir inquiry from, from a woman who may be at home all day long with children and I think um, discipline in a home is something that both parents are responsible for ultimately dad's responsible for it but if his wife is at home all day long with small children and having a difficult time he should be trying to somehow give her some relief mm. when he comes home to recognize the peculiar circumstances and trials that she has all day long with those kids by herself Amen. She might have an easier time finding some joy. Amen. <laughs> How do you advise singles to best prepare for marriage? What scriptures do you share with those who are married for making sense and steadfast in all areas of life? That's a good question. Um, I think just focusing on being the kind of person a good be, being the kind of man a good woman would want to marry and the kind of young lady a good man would want to marry and just um, waiting for the Lord. But it is better to remain unmarried than to enter into a bad marriage with a poorly chosen partner. I think that um, while we emphasize the priority of marriage is the expectation that most People will be married, but th there is true that there are some people who are called to a life of singlehood, and that's not a deficient um, second-class category in the body of Christ. Um, 
So we need to find ways to affirm people who are single and to be content in their singleness and to find other opportunities that God can use them in um, in their singleness lest they either become on the one hand feel like that they are second class or third class citizens and don't have anything to offer or on the other hand they feel pressured to get married even when it's a poor choice to, to be content in the singleness that's hard particularly if everybody around you is married and everything is you know um, sort of aimed at family and marriage which which is going to be to a large extent in the church because the because families we want thriving healthy families <clears throat> but we need to be sensitive to those who are who are in that place and not sure where they should be they need to find a place where they can serve within the body of Christ and not feel desperate that they have to be married lest they make a poor choice because they're in desperation and not content to be where they are yeah, and I think then also as you're waiting, you have to examine yourself that you're not uh, straying into covetousness, right? Like in some sense, discontentment with the single life is covetousness in its sinful expression when you're kind of saying, I want what somebody else has. God hasn't given that to you. So in some sense, we all struggle with that, right? Covetousness in our different expressions. Uh, I wish I had a child that slept through the night, right? Or... Uh, you know, I wish that my teenager was, you know, making better decisions. Like, whatever the case may be, we, we can struggle with contentment. And so um, I think uh, you, you want to make sure that you're not straying into covetousness. I mean, there are fantastic books that kind of help you with, uh, I think, Jeremiah Burroughs' Rear Jewel of Christian Contentment is a really good book that mm -hmm. you can use to read and, and kind of check yourself to make sure you're not straying into a sinful way of thinking. Yeah. If, if, if you can't be content where you are now, you will not be content wherever God places you. So circumstantial change is rarely, if ever, the answer to discontentment. If you can't be content when you're single, you'll do, trust me, there'll be more than enough imperfections in a husband you might find or a wife you might find to justify you remaining discontent. And so contentment is always a present grace where we stop believing the lie, I need more or different or other in order to be content. And we content ourselves in Christ now, which is a skill we need every area of life. But the question was, how do, how do I prepare myself? Yeah, how do you advise singles to best prepare for marriage? So, you know, the pursuit of godliness and, and contentment, those are things that you should be doing. Uh, you should be thinking about being the kind of person that a godly person would pursue. You know, so that, and then I would also think you might want to put yourself in a place where you're likely to meet someone. I mean, God can send anybody to you anywhere, you know. But you know, if I was in that situation, I'd want to put myself in a place where I was more likely, humanly speaking, to meet someone who had similar uh, desires and and ambitions. That wouldn't be at a bar. On a Friday night, obviously. That would be the wrong place to be. Christian bar? <laughs> it ought to be in the church where you where you find others who are hopefully not desperate, but where you might meet someone that you could share uh, life with. And this last one is uh, the question of little circumstantial. Should a husband... In church alone, if his family is kept at home, that's on necessity. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, I think it's it's so unless there's uh, some really good reason why he needs to be home. So maybe everybody's laid out, and, and the, the dad needs to be the caregiver. That would be a reason. But I think. If that's not the case, then as a husband, you're still leading, even though your family can't come along with you, but you're making a statement about what is primary in your life and, and primary being the joy, the worship, the God who works salvation for you. And so I think that's that would be the motivation for doing it. And, and probably because if you truly are 
a godly husband who loves the Lord, you will want to go. It will be difficult to keep you from it. Okay, let's keep moving on to the realm of fellowship. Uh, Pastor Barnes, how do you avoid the formation of cliques in the church when trying to have deep fellowship? Uh, I think the first thing you need to do is just acknowledge the fact that they will exist. Um, it's inevitable. Um, you know, people develop friendships and they're comfortable with them and they tend to be um, protective of those friendships and <clears throat> suspicious of others who come from outside. So just acknowledge that's just what happens sometimes. So you, so that at least you're sensitive to it, hopefully. Um, and of course, the leadership of the church should be careful to look for that and be the acting in a manner that's proactive to try to not you know, let them become those sort of hard, fast cliques that become sinful in nature where you're, you're actually trying to keep people out or shunning people or hiding or creating some kind of a group that nobody can penetrate. So first would be to acknowledge that. And secondly, leadership to be sensitive about it and to, to look for it and try to act against it. And then producing uh, some kind of structure in the life of the church that fosters um, the interaction of people with it with one another. There should be some sort of structure, minimal structure, that the leadership provides that fosters that kind of interaction opportunities for fellowship so that a group may be meeting over here, but that's not the only thing that's out there. There are other opportunities available. So if they, didn't, if they don't get into that group for whatever reason, they can find it in another setting. Also, people who find themselves outside a clique in the church, and I often, um, even though Christ Covenant, where I pastor like this, is a very friendly church. Everyone always talks about how well people are welcomed and it's very warm. There are always people who complain that they're, they're not part of the group or they're outside the clique. And often, in my experience, those people don't realize how much they are themselves to blame for being outside of the clique. Um, I, I, I see sometimes people who just, all they do is share their problems. And so when they walk into the hall, people scatter. Because <laughs> there's, there's pain in every pew. Everyone's carrying burdens. And if all you do is share your own, every, every conversation about how bad your life is, no one really wants to hear that. And it can be very, you know, and my, my son, he went to two different schools in Greensboro. One, he had a great experience. Well, the first one, he had a very bad experience and didn't have many friends. And the second one, he had lots of friends. And I asked him, what, what do you think is the difference? And he said, oh, Dad, I thought about that. And he's like, he was like 16. He said, this really amazed me. He said, um, he said, people have the innate ability to figure out what you think of yourself. They then agree with you and treat you accordingly. Which is like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think I figured that out. I was 50, maybe even not even that age. And so... Um, you know, sometimes people walk in, they walk into the fellowship hall and they think, I'm going to get rejected here. People aren't going to talk to me. And it's, it's like there's a big yellow sign in your head showing everyone's going to reject me. People can see that and they think, hmm, you think I'm going to reject you? You probably have a good reason for thinking that. I'm going to steer, I'm going to give, I'm, I'm going to steer <clears throat> a wide, um, a wide berth around you. And so if you find yourself outside of the, the clique in a church, rather than thinking about, oh, feeling sorry for yourself and, and thinking nobody was, nobody likes me and nobody wants to talk to me, is go in and carry other people's burdens. Go in and be warm. Go in and talk to people. Ask them how they're doing. Ask them how you can pray for them. And be an encouraging... Uh, if someone is, someone's doing things well, tell them. Be, be an encouraging force. Um, and you'll probably find people are drawn to you because they're drawn to, to a warm, outgoing person who is an encouraging force. Very good. Moving on to worship, so Pastor Stewart eliminated the lesson of necessity of the Lord's Day. It seems as if this day is under attack or neglect, and I'm told more than ever with people working, playing sports, and so on. How do we respond for generational faithfulness? Um, but the secret is to light yourself in the Lord, and to light yourself in the Sabbath, and you will take delight in the Lord, as I have to do it. And so if we, do, if we delight in the day of the Lord, we will also 
take the light in the in the Lord of the day, and the two go together like water and wind. And so, um, it, it it it's not about what we what we have to do in Sunday. What we get to do, we get to spend time with with Christ. And so it's communicating that to our children that it's, it's not. It's like um, if a couple come back from their honeymoon, and you know they come into my office and sitting like this, you know. And I say something didn't go too well, and they go, "Well, he he watched the Ryder Cup all honeymoon weekend. And when she went shopping all honeymoon weekend, I'm thinking to myself, the question is not, are, is it lawful to watch the Ryder Cup on the honeymoon weekend? But you've got better things to be doing in your honeymoon than watching the Ryder Cup or going shopping, right? It's the whole time. And so, likewise, you know, it, it's it's stressing the glory of the day to meet with Christ is the key thing in our teaching and our living." Rather than you know, thou shalt not work and thou shalt not, um, whatever. Take care of the positive aspect of the Sabbath. Everything else falls into place. Okay, this is on emotions and worship. Why does a psalm sung a certain way make me emotional, but not if I just read it? What role? music have in worship. So music is, is a device God designs to lift our soul up to the words. So the words are up here, and often our soul on Sunday morning is down here. And God often uses a melody to lift our soul toward the word, which is why music is important. But it's important that the music is something to lift your soul to. Like 10,000 Reasons, it's got this great piano riff on it. It's really, really cool. If you actually just read the song, it's really it's, it's like a loose, bad translation of like Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, O oh, my soul, and it goes on like that. But you know, the actual words by themselves are very, very unimpressive. There's not that much about God in it, but the melody is really cool. So there's got to be some substance to lift your, your soul toward, and a good tune helps do that, I think. You shouldn't be Gnostic. We shouldn't be Gnostic. Like whenever I, in the first church I went into in the Reformed faith, they sang so slowly, like be thou my vision. They sang it so slowly. You could go to the restroom in the middle of a verse and come back in the same line of music. <laughs> <laughs> and it was almost as if we sing this so slow, if any worship actually survived, it's got to be spiritual because you couldn't be enjoying it, right? And so that's the other extreme. How do we deal with continuationism versus cessationism in the context of public worship? If this was an allusion to your charismatic background. That's that's a long answer. It's a long answer. So I would say to keep it simple, uh, you do in worship what God has commanded for his New Testament church. And there are certain aspects of that worship that ceased with the apostles and certain ordinary elements that have continued on. <clears throat> you, uh, you practice those without innovating. You took the word right out of my mouth. It's amazing as well. I've heard a few times a prophet give a word, right? And both times it was... Um, a perversion of a biblical story, like the parable of the sower, but just told in modern language. Kind of like the one I told us earlier. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it sounds it sounds so much more trendy. If you got, it's, it's like fresh bread from the oven. So these new fresh prophetic words actually undermine people's word, a trust in the old Bible, right? It's much better to get a fresh pro than this kind of old book. And so... Um, it, 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 a, a lot of that charismatic chaos actually undermines people's faith in Scripture, which is a problem. Yeah, I've always thought um, the Holy Spirit took 1,500 years to produce the Scripture. So you could have a copy of it in your own hands. And yet, we want to set aside that for something that's directly given to me right now at this moment. Is, that seems to me to be disrespectful of and dismissive of the work of the Holy Spirit who produced this so you'd have a copy of it. So 
So cessationism, which I think is biblical, leads us to a more full, immediate dependence upon Scripture as the voice of God speaking to us, the Spirit of God speaking to us, the byproduct of the work of the Spirit of God over 1,500 years, and we have it in our own hands. That's a great blessing. Amen. Yeah, there have been a lot of ink spilled on that one, and there are some denominations that see a distinction, a very hard and fast distinction between what we call in the Presbyterian Church in America teaching elders versus ruling elders. So there are, um, maybe even the OPC has a three office, you know, you have minister of the gospel, and then you have elders, and then you have uh, deacons. I've never quite understood this, that argument because all the qualifications that are in the scripture for elders um, apply to any elder that is there. So there doesn't seem to be any other category. If there is another category, I don't know where the qualifications are for it uh, because 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 only address just the generic term elder, presbyter. So my, my, my perspective on the distinction, and this is where the PCA was sometimes called a two and a half office view. I'm not really happy with that, but I think there, there is a distinction between those elders that, I think I could make a distinction between those elders that preach in addition to teaching and ruling. And I think there is a separate category uh, in the scripture of, of preaching. Paul talks about being a preacher and a teacher. There's something different, and that would be a whole different subject, to s try to distinguish from what is preaching, proclamation. There's a different word used for it. Keruso is over against the word for teacher, you know, didas, galas, or, yeah. And so we get the word didactic from it. But um, so I think it'd be right to say that there's a category of officer who is elder, but some elders have different responsibilities than others. And we have made that distinction that those elders who teach, who preach, are in a different category, although in the same class, it's a subset of the one class elder. But I wouldn't say that you don't see the word, you don't see the phrase teaching elder. You don't see the phrase ruling elder. You see the phrase elder. They are generically the same in a sense. But there is a distinction that even I think the Apostle Paul makes in, in his own ministry with teaching and preaching. So that's where I've seen the distinction. Um, but, you know, that's up for debate. And I, I know there have been a lot, of, you know, better uh, theologians dealing with ecclesiology than me who have tried to address what those distinctions might be. But that makes sense to me, though, even from the Old Testament pre precedent. Because in the Old Testament, you had a category of, of um, ministers, you could say it that way, the Levites. The tribe of Levi had no land, but they were set apart to minister at the tabernacle and then the temple. But within the tribe of Levi, there was a subcategory, the descendants of Aaron, and they were the priest. So while all priests are Levites, not all Levites are priests. There's already a distinction that exists there, and only the priests were to administer the Old Testament sacraments or sacrifices. There was also a division of labor within the Levites there, which is like unto the, the way that our forefathers, I think wisely, gave the responsibility of the administration of the sacraments to those elders that, that preach. So it's like the distinction between the Levites and the, and the, and the priest. 
And the reason for that was to make sure that the sacraments and the word, the word and sacraments were never t taken apart, were held together. You ever thought about that? Yeah. Should we ever bring back the clerical collar and the Geneva gown? Uh, um, Do you wear a gown? Yes. Do you wear one? No. I don't either, but I would if the session told me to. Yeah, that's, that's what I was going to say. I think, I think to me it's an issue of uh, clearly not something that is a thou shalt from Scripture. It is an attempt to make a principle from Scripture plain. But I was um, I would say that my suit that I wear on Sundays is de facto a gown of some sort. It is a because there's nobody else, hardly anybody else that is wearing one. <laughs> so I'm the guy with the tie and the suit. So it becomes de facto something that makes me distinct. In other words, it's a, it's a vestment. In other words, that guy is invested with authority. Why is he up there preaching? Why is the judge in the state court wearing a robe sitting behind the bench? Why is he wearing, he doesn't wear the robe when he's walking on the street because he's not an officer of the state when he talks to you and says hello uh, or when he comes to my Bible study and sits across the table and we open the word of God. But when he's sitting behind the bench and he's wearing the robe, he's an officer of the state. So in a sense, a vestment in that way, the Geneva robe or whatever, acts as a, as a f official statement that this man is not just any John Doe who happens to stand up behind a pulpit and start spouting off at the mouth, but he has been invested with authority, he's been ordained for that purpose, and it's an outward and formal way of making that clear to the people that see him. I don't think it's necessary, and I didn't wear one because when I first started planning the church in Statesboro, we had five families, and we met in a time saver next to a gas pump. I just felt it was a little bit ostentatious for me to be wearing a robe in there. I already had enough problems to overcome <laughs> with being a reformed person and believing in predestination and baptizing babies and all the rest of that in Baptist world. So I figured that I would not fight that battle. But in, in my mind, uh, however, uh, I do think it's like it's still an attempt to uh, instill a sense of dignity on the on the on the preacher and the pastor, and I think. That would be what would be the important part, that the people of the church respect the office and that they have a sense of dignity for the minister, which can be expressed in a whole number of ways. And I think the Geneva gown or the collar is one attempt to make a visible statement about the person in the office. And so I think another way that you can do that is how you address, like some people have have done that by uh, addressing their minister as, as pastor so-and-so or reverend so-and-so. And so there are different ways that you can do that. I think the Geneva gown is, is one of them at doing that, uh, which which I, I would not feel compelled as necessary, but I understand what people are trying to do. In putting it on. But our culture is a very casual culture, and dress is a form of communication. It's nonverbal communication. And we communicate something to someone by what we, how we dress. And usually, most every culture has formal dress and casual dress. Even MTV has a formal dress. I know it's hard to detect it. But when they have their big you know, hoopla, they all dress up. I know it's hard to figure out the up part of it, but they dress differently than they do normally dress. And in the context in which gowns were introduced in our history, because Calvin wore them, all these guys wore them, they were an academic gown, but in the context, they were dressing down because they were, they were rejecting the pageantry of the Roman Catholic Church and all of the high vestments with all kinds of different things and everything. And they said, no, we're going to keep the gown, but it's going to be a simple black gown that doesn't, it's not ostentatious. So they were, they were actually dressing down. From our context in, a, in the United States and all of our casual culture, we, we look at it as a dressing up. But actually, in the context in which it was introduced, it was dressing down. It's also less, it provides one last thing to distract. Like, is, What's past, is the pastor's jacket poorly fitting? Is it a weird color? You know, all those things. That and it saves people. the pastor money. It does, a lot of money. <laughs> Just buy slacks and you need trousers. You don't need to talk. <laughs>